Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. For this particular series is for the first three months of 2015. It's a series on the book of Proverbs. And we're nearing the end of that discussion of Proverbs. This is lesson number 11 for March 14 of 2015. And this lesson is entitled, Living by Faith. That's interesting. That's not what you would immediately think about when you think about the book of Proverbs, I don't think. But let's see what they have to say. And we, as always, will begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is such a privilege to honor you and to think about you and to study about you from your holy word. Help us now to understand what's here for us to gather the words of wisdom that are here in the book of Proverbs, that we may draw nearer to you, we may learn more about you, and hopefully find a way soon into your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have suggested several times that Proverbs is a book about wisdom. I think that's probably uh, sort of understood by many people. This particular lesson focuses on Proverbs 28 and 29. Um, it's one of the main focuses of this, and you know how the Proverbs are. They keep jumping around talking about this and that and the other thing. But one of the main focuses on these two chapters is the difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Now, I don't know if you've tried to think about that issue recently. Is there any obvious right up front things that jump out at you, the difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Now this is not knowledge, because we all assume that God has infinite knowledge, and of course none of us have infinite knowledge, so in terms of knowledge there's a very obvious difference, but what about wisdom? How would you define wisdom? Well, people have defined wisdom in a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of people say that wisdom is the, the, the ability to correctly use knowledge, something like that, to use it very practically. Uh, Certainly God has the ultimate <coughs> use of knowledge mm -hmm. and is the ultimate in wisdom. We are far inferior, mm -hmm. some of us further inferior than others. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I won't ask you to mention any <laughs> names. <laughs> But if we are going to grow in wisdom, we need to try and follow what the Bible teaches about His wisdom. And, of course, one of the things that the lesson points out almost immediately is that God's wisdom is focused on His law. Um, have you thought of the Ten Commandments as a way to God's wisdom? What would that mean? Do you think God is <clears throat> excuse me, wise because He is loving? And, and wisdom springs from love. Okay, well we have, we have that verse, two verses in 1 John 4, 8 and 16 that say God is love. That's one of the few statements, very just heuristic statements about God in the Bible. Just It doesn't say God is this or God is something. We don't have very many statements that say God is this, God is that, but we have these very definitive statements that say God is love. Um, so if that would be the, well go ahead. What about, what about even considering the Ten Commandments wisdom? Is there, are you sure that that's even applicable? Because well, let me, let me tell you why. Because isn't the Ten Commandments, the law of God, telling about the character of God? Mm -hmm. Character is a little different than wisdom. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I mean, I can't just, my character doesn't come out because I'm thinking. It just comes out because that's who I am. And when um, you talk about God and you talk about his character, you point him to the law and say that this is his character. You know, now, now when you apply his law to things, that's where wisdom may come in right there. Mm -hmm. That's the way I kind of see it. Okay. I have a question. I've been reading Jeremiah and comment of... Uh, the scribes and whatever, misquoting and putting their own spin on some of the other laws. Mm -hmm. What do you think would have happened had 
that not happened and we only had the Ten Commandments? How would the, our yeah. characters be different? Of course, it would depend on how much, how important we thought the Ten Commandments were and whether we thought they were serious indications or serious guidelines for our lives. Um, but if we take Jesus' words for it, he said there are two parts to the love commandment. What are they? Love God. Love God, love God and love to our neighbor as ourselves. That's Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Um, and of course, we suggest that you can also divide the Ten Commandments between the first four that are basically our relationship to God and the last six, which are relationship to our, our fellow men. So we have love, then we have love to God, love to our fellow men, then we have, you know, the four and the six. And that seemed to be a pretty clear pattern in Scripture. Um, how far back does God's law go? As, well, if you ask me, it's as far as his character goes. So how far did God have his character? Okay. We, we have, I think you may be going to read a quote from Ellen White, but it clearly goes back as early as Adam and Eve and mm -hmm. before that. Okay. I'm going to read from Mount of Blessing, page 109, paragraph 2. But in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. According to some law, you've got to obey the law kind of stuff. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. What does that mean? But wouldn't that indicate that probably in some form or another, along similar lines, that the rest of God's universe works on it too? Yeah. It would have to. If the angels suddenly woke up, and there's got to be other created beings, so it yeah. must be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. and that's a, If we look at the Ten Commandments, that's a description of the way everything is meant to function. Mm -hmm. And will and and anybody that here that is in heaven will be that will be second nature to them. Yeah. So and you're you're implying then that uh, the law of God is supposed to describe the way things are. There's two kinds of laws that we know about. There's descriptive laws that just like the law of gravity that everybody's pretty much familiar with. There's a lot of other scientific laws that just describe the way things are. And then there's proscriptive laws, and that's the kind of things they do in Congress which get changed tomorrow and the next day, and, and they argue about the payment for it and so forth, all that kind of stuff. So would you say God's laws are descriptive or proscriptive? Descriptive. Why do you say that? Well, there's nobody in the, in the future. Well, first of all, there won't <coughs> be anybody living in the hereafter that is self-centered. Yes. And uh, if you're self-centered, then you need a law to tell, don't do any all these things and, and don't have any other gods and don't, uh, so on and so forth. But uh, if there's nobody self-centered, nobody will be stealing, nobody will be killing, nobody will do all the other uh, yeah. negative things. Nobody will even want to it. They won't want something that belongs to somebody else. So you're saying the angels were so happy doing what naturally came to them, yes. sharing, <clears throat> and and doing that, then when someone said a, there's a yeah. law that you have to share, that you shouldn't be selfish, they're going like, a law? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that it just flowed from them. Yeah. If you go to the war in heaven, what was, God, was, was Lucifer stealing, getting drunk, chasing pretty angels? I mean, it, it's, it, yeah. it, 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 no, it was misrepresentation, yeah. uh, uh, deception. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, False piety. <laughs> there's, a, there's a very interesting statement in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, of course, by Ellen White. And it's in the chapter where she talks about the giving of the Ten Commandments of Mount Sinai. And listen to these words. See what you make of this. If man had kept the law of God as given to Adam after his fall, after his fall, preserved by Noah and observed by Abraham, there would have been no necessity for the ordinance of circumcision. And if the descendants of Adam, uh, I'm sorry, of Abraham had kept the covenant of which circumcision was a sign, they would never have been seduced into idolatry, nor would it have been necessary for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. Now, if you stop and think about that, that's a very interesting statement because we have Abraham, we have Isaac, we have 
Jacob and Esau, and Esau is already sort of much out of the picture. So we have Jacob, and we have Jacob's sons, and they went down to Egypt. So at which point in time between Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants, his, his children, were they seduced into idolatry? It might it have been because all the sons that we know about married pagan wives? That kept them from keeping the law? Well, what happens if you if all these these supposedly I mean remember these are the guys whose ha whose names are on the gates of the kingdom of heaven. But the New Jerusalem. Wasn't everybody basically outside of them? You could point to them and call them pagan? I mean, how do you find a wife that is outside of them no. and not call them pagan? Well, yeah, it's true. And it says, nor would it have been necessary, um, I'm sorry, uh, for them to suffer a life of bondage in Egypt. They would have kept God's law in mind and there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved upon the tables of stone. It wouldn't have been necessary. Okay, now, there's something, there's a point to all this, um, this thing that she wrote here. It says at the very beginning, if man had kept the law. Mm -hmm. Now, two things come to mind. Mm -hmm. Either we had a choice that we could keep it or not, or we couldn't have kept it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And both of those work. Mm -hmm. So which one is it? Both. Both? Okay, so if we couldn't keep it in the first place, that means we couldn't have chosen to keep it. Well, we can choose to keep it. Oh. But, well, let's, let's be clear about that. We can choose to keep it. We won't keep it perfectly, but if we choose to keep it, we get as close as we can. Okay. If, we, if we don't choose to keep it, we tend to drift very far away from it. Look at our world. Now, all these people, though, that they mentioned here, they did keep it. They did keep the law, but but yet all this stuff still happened. So it if looks like it looks like what's happening here, if man kept the law, it could even say <clears throat> if man could have kept the law. Yeah. You know, all this stuff would have happened. Of course, Both statements are untrue because they didn't happen. Yeah. First they didn't decide to keep the law, nor could they have kept the law. Yeah. So yeah. um you know that point could be made. Well and had the people practiced the principles of the Ten Commandments, there would have been no need of the additional directions given to Moses. Now, some of you will be aware that there was a great discussion about 1888 in our church about whether or not the moral law was added. This passage basically says it was. Was it added because it was shown? It was given. It wouldn't have been necessary. Well, when you give it, you show it. Yeah. So, and, of, course, and so yeah. of course, it says there would have been no necessity for it to be proclaimed from Sinai or engraved on the tables of stone. So the moral law was added also. Yeah, that's my point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and I thought when, you were they saying kept, just the just no, the, no, no. The I if you if you go yeah. back and you look at volume one of selected messages, page two thirty three to two thirty five. All law was and added. She said all law was had, and if there's one more than the others, it was the moral law, especially the moral law. Okay. Okay. So coming back to Proverbs, if you read Proverbs four, seven, and nine. I mean, I'm sorry, 28 verses 4, 7, 9, because we're in Proverbs 4. If I can get figure out where my cursor is here, there we go. If you have no regard for the law, you are on the side of the wicked, but if you obey it, you are against them. How does that sound? A young man who obeys the law is intelligent. One who makes friends with good-for-nothings is in disgrace to his father. If you do not obey the law, God will find your prayers too hateful to hear. Whoa. Mm. What does that mean? I mean, it sort of sounds like our Christianity is, is, is oriented to the law almost, doesn't it? <coughs> well, there's, <coughs> there's another verse that says, the prayers of a righteous man availeth a lot. Mm -hmm. And this is the James office. Five. If you're not righteous, yeah. your prayers... You know, if people are <coughs> keeping the law, that means 
God must be with them. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you think? Sounds like it. So if people are not keeping the law, that means God is not with them. So when that happens, it, it actually fulfills that description. Yeah. Well, we recognize that ancient Israel was far from perfect in their obedience to God's law. What was unique about their situation? And really what I'm asking, and this is a question we want, we're not going to resolve right here today, but why did God choose them? Of the choices he had. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be part of the question. Maybe they were the best choice that he had. Mm -hmm. Or, I think we've discussed before, that maybe they would be the people that would demonstrate all the various responses that people might have to God, all the way from Daniel and Moses to Joseph maybe. Ahab. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. so, so we're saying that um, he did the best choice he could? The best choice that was available. Best choice. Well, well if, if, you you can, if, if you don't say that, what are you saying about God? Well, y you can look at the whole picture, though, mm -hmm. and say that, you know, everything started with Adam and Eve going to go mm -hmm. to his second coming. And if you look at the whole track of all that, that's where he chose to start out. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it as, as being successful, you know, with those people, when then you're right. I mean, there's then. Well, it's interesting to look at the chi the tribes of uh, the, the children of Israel. God says the kingly tribe is not. You know, if you had been there as they were going down into Egypt, and you said, "Okay, God, I'm going to help you pick out one of the twelve tribes here that will be the future kings of Israel," you would have said, "Joseph, wouldn't you?" I mean, I think everybody would have picked Joseph. What do we find a few hundred years later? <coughs> the tribes of Joseph were one of the first ones who went off into idolatry and disappeared into history. No, no sign of them. We, we don't even have any idea where they are. That's Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh, Manasseh and Ephraim, yeah, the, the, his children. So he chick picks the tribe of Judah. After what Judah just did in Genesis 38, he would have been the last one you would have picked. Now, didn't you just... You just... Um, described the difference between human wisdom and divine wisdom. <laughs> because it, human wisdom would have picked the, yeah. the tribe of Joseph, and but God picked the, chi tri the other tribe, Judah. Judah, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. so. Does well, God, <clears throat> God created Adam, but does God ever say why he chose Abraham? And then these others yeah. were descendants of Abraham. Genesis 26, 5 says, well, it's not the only verse, but well, in Genesis 12 talks about Abraham, you know, following God's will. And Genesis 26, 5 says he, he commanded his children and his family after him. So, I mean, that seems to be the reason why they were, they were chosen. But people are chosen before they were born. Yeah, and God goes on to say in Genesis, right there in Genesis 12, it was, it's his intention for the whole world to be blessed through Abraham. That, w that was the goal. Mm -hmm. Well, it would take you not very long, if you're a reasonably intelligent person, to memorize the Ten Commandments. In fact, probably all of you did that at some time back in school. You had to memorize in, in word perfect. Okay, I mean, you had to know it exactly right if you wanted to get a good score on your quiz. Not in public school. Not in public school. Luckily, That's they matched how many were on your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Does that <laughs> make it easier? <laughs> <laughs> but um, just knowing them, does that make you wise? Wiser than not knowing them. Okay. Here's your leg up, so to speak. Uh. Yeah. Well, God had an interesting, con well, an interesting thing happened when Solomon came along. And, of course, we're interested in Solomon because he wrote the book of Proverbs primarily. Here he is, a young man, a relatively young man, and all of a sudden he finds out he's going to be the king. And he goes down to Shiloh and he prays to God and God responds to him. And here's what he said. So give me the wisdom I need to rule your people with justice and to know the difference between good and evil. Now, David was his father. Don't you think he must have had a fair exposure to the law? He must have known the law. He probably had memorized the Ten Commandments in Hebrew. Why is he asking for wisdom? 
maybe the more you know, the more you, <coughs> you know you need to know more. That's pretty obvious. Yeah. Well, he saw the various, how can we put this, things his father got up to. Mm, yes. And he had quite a range of activity in his life, didn't he? And, and, and You're not thinking about his mother, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Among other things. I mean, he's known to be a, 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 a good soldier, David was. So mm -hmm. uh, he, he, his activity in life ran the gamut, I think, and maybe mm -hmm. Solomon in his younger years realized he needed a little extra help. Well, it's interesting, you know, how God responded. Because you've asked for wisdom and you ha haven't asked for riches and victory over your enemies and, and long life, I'm going to give you all those things. <clears throat> well, isn't one of the first stories we hear about Solomon is the story about the baby being cut in half? And, mm -hmm. you know, yes. Isn't wisdom being able to apply the law wisely? Mm -hmm. You know, he had to know how to answer those questions that people come and say, well, the law says this, and he's yeah. saying, no, it says this. Well, I still think Solomon was, was smarter than we think he is, because mm -hmm. I think when you ask for wisdom, you get all those other things, riches, power, and all that. I think he knew that when he asked for it, and God <laughs> knew that he knew that, mm -hmm. that and before, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you la da da da. And those will be the results. <coughs> yeah, those will be the results. I'm wondering if reading God's Word gives you wisdom. Like, I know congregations, every time before the preacher gives a sermon, he recites the Ten Commandments for all the congregation, them. all of them, wow. in a long version. And I always wonder if that is going to help the congregation, they still go to church on Sunday, uh, if that's going to help the congregation when times get tough, just hearing, hearing, hearing the law over and over again. Uh, do you think there's some worth in, in always reciting God's Word? Well, in my little church that I grew up in, uh, we had a huge, um, I think it was probably cloth, but something at the, behind the preacher all the time with all the Ten Commandments on it. I, well, think, I think to answer Joanne's question, it depends upon whether you just hear it Mm -hmm. or whether you listen and apply it to your life, yeah. take it so to heart. Are, are Christians' lives made easier and better by trying to observe the law? Now, Gary pointed out we're not going to observe it perfectly, but if we try, does it help? Yes, I think so. <clears throat> we do not end up in prison. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, um, is that true? I think yeah, most of the time. Ask Paul. I've found <laughs> in my life, I, I learned the Ten Commandments in JMVs. I couldn't do it now, mm -hmm. but it's <coughs> remarkable in your adult life, certain things that you come across or hear or see something happen, part of it will flick back in your mind like you were still a child. Notice that several times. So it can't hurt at all, I don't think. Train well, a boy in the way he should go. That's it. <laughs> Galatians 3, we could spend the whole night on Galatians 3, starting with about verse 19. But what do we do with verse 24? And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came. Now, that's the way most of our Christian, Christian friends would say, okay, that's, that's the way it should be interpreted. It actually turns out that it can just more likely even be to bring us to Christ. The law was in charge of us to bring us to Christ in order that we might then be put right with God through faith. So how does the law bring us to Christ? Well, before Christ came, what else did we have to look at? Well, the Ten Commandments. Well, that's true. Then when Christ came, we could look at Him, mm -hmm. which fulfilled the law. Mm -hmm. And he. the thing is that the Ten Commandments is put down in text. Mm -hmm. Christ lived it, yeah. and we're looking at his life now, and it's, it's, it's superior than the Ten Commandments, just because you get a clearer picture. Yeah. But it doesn't make the Ten Commandments um, any less important than it was before. Two years after they had that big discussion in Minneapolis in 1888, Ellen White wrote these words in the Review and Herald. We have only glimmering light in regard to the exceeding breadth of the law of God. The law spoken from Sinai is a transcript of God's character. 
Many who claim to be teachers of the truth have no conception of what they're handling when they are presenting the law to the people because they have not studied it. They have not put their mental powers to the task of understanding its significance. In another place, she wrote, the law of love is the foundation of God's government and the service of love, the only service acceptable to heaven. Now that goes back to what we said at the beginning about the very foundation of the law, right? God has granted freedom of will to all endowed men with capacity to appreciate his character and therefore with ability to love him and to choose his service. So long as created beings worshipped God, they were in harmony throughout the universe. That's why it came to the angels as something unthought of that there should be a law, right? While love to God was supreme, love to others abounded. As there was no transgression of the law, which is the transcript of God's character, no note of discord jarred the celestial harmonies. That was three, three years later in Signs of the Times. Then Christ says definitely, I came not to destroy the law, it is a transcript of God's character, and I came to carry out its every specification. I came to vindicate it by living it in human nature, giving an example of perfect obedience. And Gary, there's your point. That was now signs of the times in 1900, June 13, 1900. And one more, God's character is revealed in the precepts of his law. This is the reason why Satan wishes this law to be made of none effect. But notwithstanding all his efforts, the law stands forth holy and unchanged. It is a transcript of God's character. It cannot be impeached or altered. Signs of the Times, November 30, 1904. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Now, we talked about 1888, mm -hmm. and the law was added. So what precisely is the point of that statement? The law was added? Yeah. Well... Because we're, we're talking as if... If it's it's so important that we have to look at it, you know, like like what she was describing there, but yet it was added. Mm -hmm. So what's the point of even saying it was added? Well, and, and and if you remember her earlier statement, the law was given to Adam after he came out of the garden, observed by Noah, and followed by Abraham. So we're not talking about just the Ten Commandments written on stone. So what would that mean? That implies that what we're really talking about is God's directions for our lives. Was that it? Well, in other words, no, no other place in the universe is exactly like us. Yeah. So these ten, for example, the angels are not male or female. So what would the seventh commandment do for them? Seventh commandment? Thou shalt not commit <laughs> adultery. Well, the... If you're, See, that, if it's you're, written specific. No, and the no. Sabbath. Well, look at the Sabbath. Well, you get the back Sabbath. to that, your first point there, that adultery doesn't mean sex all the time. Oh, but it has to, do with, it has to do with your relationship to someone who's different. I know, different. but you can have that adultery okay. between your brother and your, your brother. Okay. And it doesn't have anything to do with sex. So it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. But usually it does. And when it, when well, it, but usually it does, but, but my point is the concept... It goes beyond okay. what sex is. So, so, so what we're saying here, what we're saying here is that the Ten Commandments are worded in a way specifically for human beings. It says honor your mother and father, and yeah. the angels don't have mothers and fathers, do they? Not only that, remember the Sabbath day. Sabbath only happens on this earth with a certain spin of, now there may be other kinds of Sabbaths in other worlds, we don't know. But what we know is a Sabbath depends on the spin of our particular world. So the Sabbath... Seventh-day Sabbath only has to do with this world. As far as we know. The Seventh-day one, but it, it's quite conceivable that they could have other times yeah, to get sure. together. Yeah, but, because but, but, um, to so learn from the infinite. I mean, that's... Yeah. The, but what still, if, the if you have other Sabbath. times, if you have other times, well, then why are we getting on the, the Sunday keepers for doing that on their time? Because, because, this, is, because this is the time he has given us. Okay. Planet Earth. See, he said, okay... <laughs> These are the, this is my character written down in plain, simple language as it best applies to human beings living on planet Earth. So times could be variable everywhere else, yeah. but not on the Earth. Yes. Does the law bring us <clears throat> to Jesus? Because when we see how terrible we are, mm -hmm. when we look at the law, we say, Jesus, please help us. Is that how the law brings us to Jesus? Yeah, at least partly. Yeah, I like that. 
it just seems like when when the angels were surprised that there was a law they were given the law they were looking at the law that was given to us to well, no to no the no 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 that quote from Mount of Blessings is before there was any sin. Yeah, but it's still the law, and they were, they were comparing case, We're not talking them. about the Ten Commandments now. We're talking about whatever law applied to them yeah. in heaven <clears throat> that God had to express when Lucifer rebelled. You mean they're different? Yes, absolutely. They're different? I mean, I think the basic principles are the same, but the application is going to be a little different. Well, that's how I look at it with the principles. I'm not talking okay. about the words. Okay, okay, well... If you, if you go back to love, yes. You go back to love for our fellow creatures and love for God, yes. If you go back, if you start talking about Seventh-day Sabbath in a world that spins at a certain speed, no. Heaven doesn't have a Sabbath as, as we know it. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Well, would it be correct to say that the whole purpose of the Bible is to teach us about God and His character? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, how do we learn about God and His character? Does that require, we call, we call it faith, does that require being intelligent, learning, thinking? Does God intend for faith to be a rational experience? You know that a lot of people think faith is a leap in the dark. Well, Ellen White said this, and I'm leaning on her pretty heavily today, uh, this is from Steps to Christ, page 105, paragraph 2 and 3. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. Now, how is evidence evaluated? By our own mind. God, the only way God can communicate with us is through our mind. <clears throat> this is not something that comes in, you know, there are these, there are preachers on television who say, the Spirit came on me and it came up through my feet and it came up through my legs and through my stomach. And that's not the way God's intelligence comes. It comes to our minds. Okay. So God's intelligence is not feeling. Not, at least not only feeling. Not only feeling. Yeah. Okay. Well, you got to have, uh, it, you can have faith in yeah. anything. Yeah. I mean, what, what separates the faith from the bad faith is uh, one faith makes sense and the other doesn't. Well, okay, we go on here. His existence, God's very existence, His character we've been talk about, talking about, the truthfulness, tr sorry, the truthfulness of His Word are all established by testimony that appeals to our reason. And this testimony is abundant. Okay? Yet God has never removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. Yes? The sentence, our faith must rest on evidence, not demonstration, seems to me a paradox. Isn't demonstration, isn't that evidence, isn't evidence demonstration. Um, yeah. Well, partly, I, yes. I'm, I'm not confused. sure what the meaning of that sentence I is. I think what she's trying to say is God is not going to lay things out so there's no possibility of doubt. He's not going to make it so compelling that you just can't possibly escape the conclusions. Well, that's what he, it says he, later there. But yeah. He, 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 he spells out, he provides enough evidence so those who are intelligent and willing to, to look at the evidence can get the message. But if, if you want to doubt, you can doubt. Is that saying that God will not demonstrate upon, for us upon command? Oh, God has demonstrated. I mean, look at the life of Jesus. Wasn't that a demonstration of how to live the Ten Commandments? But if, I mean, we say, God, I want to know if you exist, so make this table jump. Well, and so God yeah. uh, doesn't demonstrate whenever we want, uh, but he tells us to use our mind to collect evidence. There are faithful, fa uh, famous atheists who walked up, like, for example, on the steps of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., and said, if there's God, let him strike me dead right now. And of course, God doesn't strike them dead, and he's positive proof that God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that evidence that God doesn't exist? We well, laugh. It's, it's evidence that a certain type of God doesn't exist. Yeah. 
It certainly it means that a God, the kind of God he's con he can control, doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well, it is impossible for finite minds fully to comprehend the character or the works of the infinite one. To the keenest intellect, the most highly educated mind, that holy being must ever remain clothed in mystery. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Job 11.7. And that steps to Christ, as we mentioned. In fact, I would suggest, I certainly hope this is true, that we will continue to learn about God for the rest of eternity. So we certainly wouldn't be presumptuous enough to think that we can learn everything we need to know about God in this one tiny little short life here on planet Earth. Well, uh, look at 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you do not love the Father. Everything that belongs to the world, what the sinful self desires, what people see and want, and everything in this world that people are so proud of, none of this comes from the Father. It all comes from the world. The world and everything in it that people desire is passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. But God does grant us good things. Yeah. So. But do do you do you um, do you get you achieve or do you, you have access to those good things by uh, by following the customs of the world? Some in yeah in some areas yes. It depends on what you mean by custom of the world because we are we do live in this world and we have to follow certain rules and what have you. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on how you take the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Because there are things we do, like practically, that we have to do, that we need. And I believe God grant us good things. Okay. Yeah, no. I mean, w everything that's out there comes from God, We yeah. ultimately. So the good as well as the bad, if you will. Well, Proverbs 28 gives us several suggestions about true wealth. Okay, you want to be wealthy? Here's what Proverbs 28 suggests. One, do not get rich at the expense of the poor. Proverbs 28, 8. Be, two, be generous with the poor. Proverbs 28, 27. Wealth should come from honest hard work. Proverbs 28, 19. Do not use any dishonest means for gaining wealth. Proverbs 28, 20, 22, and 24. Right there in a few verses. Well, but we know that in our day, money has come to be a dominant force in our world. Why is that? It's always been that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, Power. there were there were there were thousands of years when money didn't didn't thousands of years when money didn't even exist. Well but other things barter. served as barter. 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 Yeah. Okay. I mean you look at the tulips in Holland. Yeah. yeah. I mean I, it's power. Mm -hmm. More money is well, it, more it power basically what you, what what money is is it represents a, a certain amount of work and, and effort that you put forth, and now that money that effort and work is sort of, if you will, symbolized by that money you have in your hand, and and then you can you can what you're doing is you're selling some of your effort for whatever you want to buy. Yeah. Well, with money you can satisfy the three desires: the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and what's the other desire? Of life. The pride and the of pride life. of life. Yeah. yeah. Get your Tesla. One uh, one <laughs> sage said, "Money isn't everything, but it's way ahead of whatever's in second place." Yeah. <laughs> that that would be the world's attitude, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, in light of a world constantly fighting over keeping up with the Joneses, how do we keep God up out of, uppermost in our minds, our thinking? How do how do we keep God right up there? and not be caught up with this efforts to, you know, drive a better car, live in a better house, all that kind of stuff. Have more money. <laughs> well, there's now, all I kinds of ways you can do that. This is a difficult question. No one has a an answer. I, I just don't know if it's the one you want. <laughs> my, my sister, um, she couldn't take any more work uh, about when she was in fi her 50s, mm -hmm. early 50s. She uh, shopped at thrift stores. She says, I will do anything but work. So it's your priority. She, wow. 
she didn't care how, you know, I mean, she looked fine to me, but she shopped in thrift stores. She did anything she could so she wouldn't have to be in the work world. I see. Yeah, so. Uh, Some of them work harder at that than if they uh, my, a job. <laughs> my son works as a lawyer, and some people think that's not very hard work, and I probably would agree with that. But <laughs> he, makes, he makes plenty of money, but he still likes to shop at the thrift stores. He, thinks he just loves to go in those kind of places and look for some Art. unusual bit of clothing or something like that that you can't find anywhere else. He thinks that's wonderful. So to, to stay faithful with God, I ha think you have to have the world not get its hooks in you yeah. and to take the priorities of the world. By beholding, we become changed. Oh. Yes. We, be we become like that which we allow our minds yeah. to dwell upon. Right. What's it, Great Controversy 555? Five, five, five? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bring it down to where the rubber hits the road, regular study and perusal of God's Word. Look at Proverbs 29:13. Does this should this be an equalizer? A poor person and his oppressor have this in common: the Lord gave eyes to both of them. And that's a, a way of saying God created all of us to be equal, right? Do we? Does that give us any excuse for thinking we're superior to somebody else? The way I read it, it's saying the person and his oppressor have basically nothing in common except, you know, what God, God, created. God created in them. Mm -hmm. the, what is verse 16? They have totally it? different, <coughs> different Verse outlooks. 16? Mm -hmm. Proverbs 29, 16. When evil people are in power, uh, crime increases, but the righteous will live to see the downfall of such people. Hmm. It's, it's quite a bit... Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, what about Proverbs 28.3? We're just picking some verses out of these couple of chapters. Someone in authority who oppresses poor people is like a driving rain that destroys the crops. Driving rain, yeah. Yeah. Hail, maybe? You shouldn't oppress poor people because they do the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need them as workers, so treat them right. What about verse 6? What do you make of this one? Proverbs 28, verse 6. Better to be poor and honest than rich and dishonest. <laughs> a poor, who said that? A poor person said that. Many of those no, things. No, Solomon said that. He was one of the wealthiest That's guys what I don't understand. That's why Proverbs confuses me sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem like the things he's saying would come from yeah. us, a person of means. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the kind of thing that could be in poor Richard's almanac, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That. Yeah. Well, some of the others about God wouldn't be, but... Yeah. Uh, well, do we, do we agree and do we live as if honesty and righteousness always trump riches? No. Well, it takes out, it depends how long you wait. Yeah. Well, remember that the, the Jews had a, an idea. What was their idea? If you're good, God will bless you. If God is blessing you, you're going to do what? You're going to, you're going to have money. You're going to be wealthy. So you watch the guy who drives down the street in a Mercedes, and that means he's the righteous guy, right? We still have that Absolutely. kind of theology today. A lot, a lot of people believe that, even in our day. And there's a lot of support in the books of Moses for that, even though we don't really believe that it's true. There isn't really that much support in Job, though. Job seems like he's... Well, we know that in our world, at least, things are not that simple. Well, and, and what about this? And I put this to you out in the audience as well. Are you ever tempted to compromise your principles? Maybe to gain a little extra money? One of the biggest challenges for parents these, uh, dealing with these important lessons is uh, teaching, how, well, put it this way, how do we give our children the right, we, how do I teach our children the right attitude toward money? They, they observe every move you make when you're a parent. By observation, they're going to absorb what you do. It is a, a well look at 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. Uh, two, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10, yeah. Um, and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. They will perish because they did not welcome and love the truth 
so as to be saved. Are we teaching our children to welcome and love the truth? We do our best. <laughs> we should be striving from infancy to do yeah. that. We're trying, but the culture is mm -hmm. doing a riptide the other way. The devil is doing everything he can to keep that from happening. There was a quotation from one of the earlier lessons that you had, something to the effect of uh, the children say, your actions speak so loudly that I can't hear your words. Yeah. Yeah. How do we teach our children to receive, well, how do we avoid teaching them to receive not the love of the truth? Well, seems like you figure that out after you had your kids and they've grown up. Is the truth the most important truth we need to learn, the truth about God? Yes. And I quote, this is from the book Education, page 14, paragraph 2. Whatever line of investigation we pursue with a sincere purpose to arrive at the truth, that's our goal, right? We are brought in touch with the unseen mighty intelligence that is working in and through all. The mind of man is brought into communion with the mind of God, the infinite with the finite with the infinite. The effect of such communion on the body and mind and soul is beyond estimate. So how would that how would that be applied? Is she saying that whenever we seek truth, no matter if it's a scientist or a um, <clears throat> a shopkeeper, or whatever? that God is working with that person? Well, in the days before evolution became a major force and so forth, the scientists all used to say, in studying the laws of nature, we are, we are, we are yeah. learning about the mind of God. And I think that's still true. They may, the, some of our scientists' friends might not be willing to admit that, but God is the one who made those rules. He's the one who created <coughs> matter the way it is. Well, Proverbs goes on, and now we're moving into chapter 29. Um, look at verses 15 and 19. Correction and discipline are good for children. If they have their own way, they will make their mothers ashamed of them. Verse 15 and 19, you cannot correct servants just by talking to them. They may understand you, but they will pay no attention. And all the children, educators that I know, who talk about how to you know, bring up children, children need barriers. They need to know this is acceptable, that's not acceptable. If they don't learn that, you are in for big trouble. Verse 19, you cannot correct servants just by talking to them. So how is that implying that you need something more than that? You need physical punishment? Well, how about demonstration? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you know, have to be time. an example. Yeah, you can't just sit there and mouth the words. You probably need to get out there in the sand and, and show them how things are put together and how yeah. to conduct one's life. That's why Jesus came. Is that what I'm supposed to do with the kids, too? Yeah. Well, and the question, of course, would be are, are spanking still appropriate? No. <laughs> well. It doesn't say that here. The, the 15 says, God. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. We've read yeah, that exactly. one another way. So, But you can, yeah. you can discipline children without hitting them. That depends mm. a little on their personality. That's yeah, right. Really That's does. true, too. I, uh, somewhat. Because what I, about timeouts? Yeah, there are, are other those things. appropriate? That yeah, depends that on the child, too. Oh, that's right. Some of them, that... You put them in the corner and they're gone. <laughs> well, you can. You they can. enjoy themselves in the corner. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's right. There comes a time when a little laying of hands. The problem is with the family broken like it is and people on drugs and stuff, it doesn't get just to wrap over the knuckles. They, yeah. they do damage, you, and that you, is wrong. You probably have heard the expression that a pat on the back is useful if it's applied early enough and low enough. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little incident. Yesterday I took care of my 15-month-old granddaughter, and I have a 12-year-old dog. They mm. were both in the kitchen yesterday. <laughs> okay. And 
I don't remember which one was doing something, but I said, uh, uh, uh. And they both looked at me like, <laughs> Since, no, I was talking to the dog, not you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, children need most of all, we, perhaps most of all, to know where the boundaries are. They need to know that certain things are acceptable and certain things are not acceptable. And somehow or other, we need to get that message through to them. Otherwise, they will be a total disaster. Undisciplined children will be ashamed of their parents and even to the children themselves when they become adults. And Ellen White says, again, I'm quoting, any child that is permitted to have his own way will dishonor God and bring his father and mother to shame. Light has been shining from the word of God and the testimonies of his spirit so that none need err and regard to their duty. God requires parents to bring up their children, to know him and to respect his claims. They are to train their little ones as the younger members of the Lord's family to have beautiful characters and lovely tempers that they may be fitted to sh shine in the heavenly courts. By neglecting their du duty and indulging their children in wrong, parents close to them the gates of the city of God. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 325 and 326. Boy, could we be shutting our children out of the kingdom of heaven? Mm. Yes, and I think we should. Allowing that, you can shut, shut the gates of the local city to them. Mm. Or you even get to heaven. Do most of your people that you know, let, look at the people that attend your church or other Christians that you know about, do they think of the law of God as a great blessing, a, a quote, a law of liberty, or do they think of it more like a straitjacket? You got to think about that one for a moment. Well, I think there are undoubtedly facets, facets of life, shall we say, that think it's a straitjacket. What does it forbid us to do? Harm ourselves. Wrong. Yes. Yeah. Forbids us to do what's wrong. Is that, a, is that a limitation of our freedom? Yeah, it is. Is it a limitation of our freedom that we should welcome, that we should be happy about? Yes. But it is a limitation of our freedom. But Satan is always trying to get us to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Remember the Hebrews 11 talking about Moses. Um, what, are the what are the benefits of disobeying the law? A hangover. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wouldn't call that a benefit. Well, the, in the final analysis, eternal death. Yeah. There are no okay. benefits. Well, hold on. We all sin. There's a reason we sin. So let's, let's not be dis unfair here. Is it Enjoy fun the at the time? Okay, it, yeah, okay, and that's what Satan's job is to try to convince us that sin is fun, for, at least for right now. Here and now. Here and now. It's all about the here. Worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah, he, Satan never wants us to think about the longer term results because he knows what those are. They're not good. Well, as we've suggested, we talked a little bit earlier, many of our Christian friends believe that the, the, the law was nailed to the cross. What, how do we respond to that idea? Christ or the apostles never said anything about the law being done away with. Is there any evidence in the New Testament that Jesus or any of the apostles ever disobeyed any of the commandments? No. No. None. Well, they did, but not uh, intentionally. They, that wasn't yeah. their goal to. No. And, and this question we need to keep asking, we've asked lots of times before, do we really believe this? Does God ever ask us to do, any, do or believe anything that is not for our best good in the long term? Now you would say, did God ask Christ to go through that last weekend in his life? It wasn't for his best good in the short term but it was definitely the, for the best good of the whole universe in the long term. That's what we're talking about, right? Well, why do so many of our Christian friends think that the time has come to set aside the ancient, outdated constraints of the Word of God? You're talking about a misunderstanding of Colossians 2.14? <laughs> yes. That's one of the, one of the excuses yeah. they use, yeah. yeah. Are these ancient, outdated constraints still appropriate in the 21st century? 
or should it be all right to kill and steal and, and, and commit adultery and dishonor our parents and disobey the Sabbath and lie and worship then idols? Then you're breaking the, the two commandments that God gave us. That yeah, Christ that, that is a problem. Well, we got to look at the evening news to see the countries that don't have any laws that even come out close to this. Or what do you do about the person that says, well, I did it under the blood? Yeah. I mean, that it's, how do you communicate it? You know, where do you? Right. You can do whatever you like, but you pray once and you'll get forgiven. Why you go again? Well, don't you believe that scientists are an answering all the most important questions and all we have to do is believe what modern science has discovered and discovering and eventually we'll be able to live forever? I would rather believe God than a man. Okay. Well, is it obvious with a superficial look at the Ten Commandments that they are describing God's love? Not superficially. Not superficially. They sometimes do, may, may seem like a straitjacket. If you ask the teenager, the average teenager, he might say, yeah, that seems a little bit like a straitjacket. I can't, I can't. Hmm? I can't. Seems like I can't, I can't. Well, the interesting thing is that God gave them the Ten Commandments at what point in their history? after he had saved them out of Egypt, right? So does that mean that salvation comes first and then obedience? And he gave it to them after they'd just been slaves for a mm -hmm. couple hundred years. Try to imagine what it was like for Adam and Eve to walk with God in the cool of the evening in the garden. Did they have any re reservations about whether or not being like God was a good idea? Try to imagine what they did. Do we believe that God's word is the ultimate source of wisdom in our day? Well, our world seems to be coming apart at the seams. Desperate things are happening. People are being killed by the thousands in some cases. Other people are absolutely hell-bent on killing others and all that kind of stuff. So is there a place for people living Christ-like lives as a demonstration of God's love? Could we actually live lives that would lead others looking on, say, praise God, Matthew 5, 16? Try it. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for this opportunity to witness for you. We have done our best, and we leave it up to you now that how it might, have, how it might reach that needs to hear it and how it might affect their lives. We leave all these things and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.